Welcome everyone to Science Holic's first ever webinar. We are very excited today to have invited Dr. Stuart Feierstein as our as our first guest. Personally, um, just to introduce myself, I am Scarlett Chu, and I will be the host of this webinar. Hi everybody, my name is Molly Zhao, and I'm the co-founder of Science Holic. Yeah, I'm Joyce. I am co-founder too of the Science Holic organization. We're very excited to start this webinar right now. So, Dr. Feinstein, would you like to do a short introduction of, of yourself? Sure, sure. So I'm Stuart Feierstein, and let me first of all thank the organizers of Science Holic for inviting me and for arranging all of this. It's been, uh, it's, it's been marvelous. The ability to do it is great, even though we're not so happy about being in the middle of a pandemic, we are able to do these sort of worldwide things, and that's quite exciting and very interesting. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. So I've been asked to kind of introduce myself, which I don't typically do. So I'll tell you just a couple of things and then we'll, and then you stop me when you've heard enough or, or I'll stop myself, I hope. And then we can go on and talk about uh, Scientolic and some questions as well. I, um, I'm currently a professor at uh, Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, where I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences. My specialty is neuroscience. I both run a laboratory there that I'll tell you about the research in a moment. And of course, I teach a couple of classes. Uh, the class I'm teaching at the moment is called Cell and Molecular Neuroscience. So that's kind of what, to some extent, what I do. We also have a systems and development class in neuroscience that some of my colleagues teach. And then in my uh, laboratory, we work, uh, the laboratory is graduate students, postdocs, uh, a couple of research associate scientists as well. Um, it's not actually as quite as big as that just made it sound. There are only a few people in it now. At one time I had quite a large laboratory, now it's a bit smaller. And we work uh, primarily on the vertebrate olfactory system, the sense of smell, which we are, uh, which we and I am interested in because I think it's a very cool sensory system the ability to smell, and also uh, it's a great model system for understanding many other features of the brain, things like how we recognize drugs and transmitters and hormones and things like that. The receptors that we use in our nose to recognize odors is, are very in the same family of receptors called G-protein coupled receptors. We can talk about this later. Um, they're in the same family of receptors. And so we think the work we do will have a lot to do or could have a lot to do with rational drug design, with understanding how these receptors are able to detect so many different sorts of molecules in the world and so forth. And then also there's this interest about perception, how we turn a, 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 a mixture of molecules um, into a perception, like a rose or a cup of coffee or uh, whatever it might be. And so that's also of interest to us. And then, to some extent, because it was such an understudied area for many years, we have a tendency to uh, be visually oriented. And so there are many, many people studying the visual system, in particular in the retina, but even in the cortex and so forth. And so there are many people who work in the visual system, and I just found it a little too crowded for me. So I was interested in sensory systems, and I was interested in animal behavior. And I thought, well, what system is the closest related to behavior? And I thought, well, that's really the olfactory system for most animals. And it turns out for us as well, but we can get to that later. Um, and so I looked at the olfactory system and realized that there were many, many interesting open questions in the olfactory system and not that many people at the time working on it. Now it's become more, I think, of a, a mainstream field in neuroscience, which I'm quite happy about. And of course, two of my colleagues, Richard Axel and Linda Buck, who were both at Columbia at that time, uh, discovered the, fam the gene family of olfactory receptors, which turns out to be quite large. We have over a thousand genes in our genome that encode olfactory receptors. So if you think about that, we only have about 20 to 25,000 genes <laughs> making up our entire genome. So something between one and three or four percent of the genes in typical mammal are devoted to the olfactory system specifically. They just encode olfactory receptors. And indeed, Buck uh, and Axel Linda and Richard Linda Buck and Richard Axel won a Nobel Prize for that work. So that suddenly put the field on the map, and many more people are interested in it now, which is very good. 
So, um, so that's the science side of my introduction. Let me quickly tell you about my other interest, which is uh, of equal interest to me these days. And that is, I think, the idea of uh, public access to science, public understanding of science, the ability of scientists to reach out to a wider public, because I fear that science has become too insulated from the public. And we see that today in the general mistrust and distortion of scientific ideas among a wide ranging public, even, even a well-educated public, I have to say. So this is not just people that are dumb or uneducated or who we can dismiss in some way or another as being simply stupid. I mean, there are many, many people um, who are college graduates, but who still, I think, have a very poor understanding of science and a very uh, a poor uh, opinion of science. So I think that should change. It would be nice to change that. Towards that end, I've written a couple of books that you know about. Of course, that's probably why you invited me as much as anything else. One of them was this book called Ignorance. That came out of a class that I started. And as I say, to some extent, I think I say it in the book, but I'll say it here as well. I, I began to recognize teaching this class in neuroscience, the one that I'm teaching now, which uses this big, heavy, used to use, we changed, but we used to use this big, heavy textbook called Principles of Neuroscience. And I learned on Amazon, looking, looking it up, that it's not only 1,414 pages, but it weighs seven and a half pounds, which is, uh, to put this on some scale, about twice the weight of an adult human brain. So if it was a book on the brain that weighed twice as much as the brain that's in your head. That seems somehow or another weird. And so I thought teaching this class, you know, that, um, that well, we were giving students quite the wrong idea about science and neuroscience in particular, that number one, must have seemed like everything we we knew everything there was to know. I mean, you have this gigantic book. I would give twenty three lectures with tons of facts in it, and so they must have had the impression that we knew an awful lot about the brain, if not everything. And that's clearly not true at all. And then I think the second wrong impression that we give many students is that what scientists do is work away in the lab to come up with a bunch of facts that they then write up in papers that get into textbooks that they have to then memorize for an exam, which is not much fun. And that's not true either. I mean, that's not what we do in the lab. We almost never talk about what we know. We only talk about what we don't know, of course. That's what's interesting. What's the question? What, what's the open question? What can we do about getting to know this? What will happen if we get about to if know something and so forth? And so I thought, well, maybe it would be interesting to run a class like that. So I started this class called, um, which I called Ignorance, and I did that to be intentionally provocative, I suppose, to some extent, because I don't mean simple stupidity or, a, or a, um, not caring about facts or anything like that, an indifference to fact, but rather the idea of this sort of communal ignorance, that the, what we don't know is so much more important and so much more interesting than what we do know. And if this is what science is about, when scientists go to a conference or whatever, yeah, we listen to talks and people tell us about some finding they had, but then as soon as we can, we retire to the bar and have a beer together and we talk about all the things that we don't know and how we're gonna figure this out and who's working on that and how what, what approach could we use for this and why this question is important. To it. So I had people come into my class, this small class that I ran originally and, and uh, I would ask members of the faculty at Columbia, science faculty at Columbia or fortunately because I was in New York, there were people who would come through the city to give seminars and all that and I would try to hook them and I'd say, look, I, would you come do this class? I have a joke about it. I used to say, you know, I'd call them up and I'd say, listen, I'm, I'm running this class called Ignorance and I think you'd be perfect for it. And so, so you know, the, they would laugh, but then everybody would say, yes, you're absolutely right, of course. That's, you know, that, that is exactly what I do. So they would come and talk for, the class would meet once a week, usually in the early evening. And uh, I'd have these guest speakers or guests, I just call them, come in and we would have a conversation for about two hours about what they didn't know. So no PowerPoint, no keynote, no lecturing, nothing like that. Just let's talk about what questions you have, why you have those questions, what other questions there are that you feel are for some reason or another less important. How did you arrive at those questions? What will happen if you answer those questions and so forth? And then uh, an editor from Oxford Press happened to come to the class one day. I was having dinner with her that night about some other book she wanted me to work on um, that I didn't want to do, but she was going to take me out to dinner and, and try and convince me to work on this other book. And so she came to the class, so we would have dinner afterwards and afterwards. 
we got to dinner and she said to me, forget that other book. I want you to write a book about this class. It's too interesting. So I'd never written a book before. I'm a scientist. I write papers. You know, that's what I did. But I thought, well, I'll try. I have, by that time, I'd been teaching the class about six years. So I had a lot of material. And um, I sat down and wrote the book. And so that's what I did, basically. And uh, it took me, I don't know, I can't remember now. I think it took me six months. But when I look back at how long, how many, the dates on the files from when I actually first started the book to when I handed in a draft, it was closer to two years. But it felt like it took six months. Anyway, I wrote this book and it became sort of popular. And the book is about science, but it's about how we do science. And the fact that this may seem trivial, of course, that science is about what we don't know. But often it turns out that things that we take for granted, things that we all know implicitly, I mean, I think everybody here would agree with me that science is about what we don't know, right? That's what we do in science. That's why we call it research. If we knew it, we wouldn't do it already, right? But so we all know that implicitly, but making it explicit has some value to it because you, you make many assumptions with the word ignorant or we don't know, and you just sort of say that and go on. And that's not true. For example, our whole education system, which you folks are all in the midst of, as you well know, all the way through it, many, most of you, I assume, are uh, those of you who are in college are probably science majors. But I can tell you that even all the way through college, you will get a taste of science. Even as a science major, um, you will get a taste of science as if it's a lot of facts. You will be told a tremendous amount of information and almost nobody will talk to you about the questions that are open. I mean, they'll mention it on the side. They'll say, this is still an area of research. We don't know this entirely, but here's what we think we know. And then they'll test you on what you know, we think we know. And so, as you know, an awful lot of science classes and what keeps people away from science classes is that they think it's all about memorization and facts. And many people are put off by what they see as this mountain of facts that they could never hope to know all. And that's true. You could never hope to know all of them. I don't know all of them. You know, the number of papers that I can read in, in a journal like Nature in any given week is read. I'm lucky if there's one paper out of the 20 they publish that I can just, you know, read and understand quickly. I mean, there are others that I can read through and get the gist of, but I don't have the expertise to read them. And, and there's no way one could. So the more interesting thing is how do we frame the questions, I think. And you don't really, it's not until, I'm sorry to say, you get to graduate school, for example, that somebody says to you, I don't really care what you know. I want to know what you want to know. I want to know what question you're going to come up with for your thesis. That becomes the important thing. And so, of course, you have to know stuff. I mean, you know, if you want to be a scientist, you have to know things. But if you want to be a lawyer, you have to know things. If you want to be a plumber, you have to know things. So there's always stuff to know. That's true. Well, we shouldn't concentrate on the stuff to know. The, the really way to think critically, I think, is to think about what we don't know. Well, that's a bit more of an introduction than just an introduction, I suppose. So um, no, right. don't let me just keep on talking. I mean, you need to ask me questions. Part of the problem is I, I, I'll start accelerating how fast I talk. I already talk too fast. And if you don't stop me and let me reset, I'll just start babbling on at a terrible speed and you won't understand the word I say. No, it's so right. remind me to stop for questions. It's okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. It was really insightful. Yeah. So before we move on to the questions, let me give you a brief introduction of what Science Holic does as a nonprofit. We are a youth-run nonprofit that aims to introduce intricate scientific top concepts in a manner that is fun and comprehensive to teens. Our main priority is to serve as a free resource for students to learn more about science topics. And we strive for our teenage readers and contributors to be critical thinkers and promote thought-provoking conversations. We also provide various opportunities for students around the world with English as their second language to expand their English ability and provide volunteer and leadership opportunities to those who want to help others. Now, let's start with the first area, large area of our questions. Dr. Feinstein, Professor profession and research. Um, just a quick uh, to specify, the bolded question on the top is the questions that we, Scientology, have thought of to ask Dr. Feinstein. And occasionally you will see attendee questions on the bottom. Those are from the Google registration forms that 
all of your attendees have sent us with that and we think that uh, searching questions really you know, go hand in hand with each other so that's why we put them on the same page. So even though you might have already covered this a little bit in the introduction, what first sparked your interest in biology and your faculty system? <clears throat> Well, so I'll, I'll tell you a story about that a little bit because I have a slightly unusual background this way. And I think it's important for you all to realize that there are many pathways into science. Mine was particularly torturous and weird. And so uh, you should know <laughs> what one of the boundaries is. So when I finished high school, I did not go to college. I did not want to be a scientist. I worked in the theater as a, well, at the time, just as an, as an apprentice, eventually I, I had a career in the theater for some years, and eventually I became a director and stage manager, and I did some lighting design as well. But primarily my work was as a director, occasionally a stage manager in the live theater. So when I left high school, I went off to work with, in those days, especially you didn't go to college if you wanted to work in the theater, you uh, apprenticed yourself to somebody whose work you liked, and that's what I did. I worked as an apprentice for a number of years with a different directors. I moved scenery around, I got props, I did lighting, I did all the, the grunt work, and then eventually became a stage manager, and that's where you work very closely with a director, and then eventually had an opportunity to be a director myself, which I was for a number of years. And that was uh, for about 15 or so years, or until I was in my late, very late 20s, early 30s, and I had developed an interest along the way. I always liked science anyway, and I developed an interest in animal behavior. I had some idea about doing some, putting together some performance with a group of people that explored human-animal relationships over the years, both in ritual and religion and philosophy and history and agri agriculturally, scientifically, in all sorts of different ways. And I was interested in this human-animal relationship, and that's what got me interested in animal behavior. And so I had moved by that time to San Francisco. I went there with a show, on tour with a show, and I decided to stay in San Francisco and be part of the theater scene there. And I eventually wound up, there was this one particular show that I did the lighting for and was stage manager for this show. And it became, uh, it was a big hit. It opened, became a big hit. I had a lot of time on my hands. In other words, I was employed. But I was only working at night, of course, to do the performances. And I had my days free. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I go take a class in animal behavior? And so I went to the State University, San Francisco State University, Cal State San Francisco, and I found a class on animal communication taught by a fellow named Hal Markowitz, who became a very important mentor for me. I'm sorry to say he passed away just a few years ago, but he was for many years a very important mentor for me, and especially then. And so I took this class in animal behavior and animal communication, and I was thrilled by it. I mean, I sat there this may sound sort of silly but but i you know i sat there and this guy stood up and told me everything he knew about some thing you know and i could ask questions about it and i thought well this is a great idea i mean who thought of this you know i'd never been to college before i mean it turns out i think it was aristotle that thought of it <laughs> so i was maybe 2500 years behind and even before aristotle probably but anyway um and so he convinced me to take another class with him, which I did, because I enjoyed this one so much, in animal, also in animal behavior. And then I began uh, getting involved a little bit in his research, which was quite interesting in animal. He was interested in the behavior of wild animals in captivity. So he wanted to know what we could do in zoos and aquaria to make um, an animal's life psychologically more interesting that we spent too much time worrying about whether the exhibit that an animal was in looked like their home environment, looked like a savanna or you know a forest or this or that. And that wasn't what was important. What was important was the psychological well-being of an animal that you're going to keep in, in a captive situation. So, and that was his interest. And we learned quite a lot about wild animals and animals in captivity and their intelligence and things of that nature. So. It was, it was really interesting research. Um, in any case, I kind of got bitten by that, I suppose. And he convinced me that I should then go do a, uh, I should try and get a degree in biology. Why not get an undergraduate degree? Well, I was 30 years old at the time, but I thought, okay, I'll try it. So I started undergraduate at 30 years old. That was the first time I'd been to college. So, so that's a bit odd, right? Um, so I didn't just go right 
from high school into college. There was this long period in between. And I continued working in the theater during this time. I was working at night on shows, and during the day I would uh, go to classes. So the only interesting part of the story, really, that I will tell you is, because this is how things happen from many different ways in life that you can't predict. Um, the, the idea of getting a degree in biology was interesting to me, but I also knew that one of the requirements was organic chemistry, or what we call orgo, which is a sort of, you know, these weed out classes. It's a very difficult class. A lot of people, uh, they get to organic chemistry and decide, okay, forget it. I'm not doing science. I can't do this. It's too difficult. I don't want any parts in it. And um, so I thought, well, that's going to be a problem. I should take it as soon as I can. So I took a semester or two of general chemistry to brush up on that because I hadn't been to school in a while. And then I took organic chemistry and I thought, well, this is it. Make it or break it. If I can't pass organic chemistry, I'm not going to get a degree in biology. So a big amount of memorization. You just have to memorize one reaction scheme after another. I mean, there are some fundamental principles, but most of what you do in organic chemistry is you memorize, you know, the various reaction steps to get from here to vinyl or some other crazy thing. It's, it, it isn't much, much fun at that level. It's just all this memorization that goes with it. The, the, the thing is, you know, I had spent 15 years in the theater doing nothing but memorizing scripts. That's what I did for a living. I memorized things, right? I mean, I did other things with them. But I was used to memorizing an entire script. I did, had no problem. So I just memorized my way through organic chemistry. I aced the course. <laughs> Who would have thought? And I really loved organic chemistry because once you get past the memorization thing, it's really an elegant, beautiful, magnificent subject that you know, the chemistry of carbon, of course, leads you to life sciences and all the rest of that. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why I got interested in olfaction eventually, because, of course, most odors are organic chemicals. And so you need some organic chemistry to know how to do olfaction. And so this, there was this curious thing where my 15 or 18 years experience in the theater actually served me quite well in one of my first great challenge in science, which was organic chemistry, because I had this memorization skill all honed up. So you never know what's going to work out for you and where you're going to pick up something that's useful. So I'm not sure that exactly answers that question, but that's, I told you about the olfactory system earlier. No, that was a very interesting story you gave. I never thought that someone like with <laughs> such like high achievements in the science like, side of things would start so late, like comparatively late. So I think this is an idea that, that you all are given by, um, by the science establishment, you know, that you really, you have to stay right on the beam, you have to stay focused, and there's nothing wrong with being focused, I think that's good, but I also think you should relax a little bit about it. I mean, one of the things that we, um, one of the things that we often see with graduate students is that they get into graduate school finally, and now they're in a big rush to do their thesis. They want to get their thesis done, get moving with their life and all of that. And I understand you want to get moving with your life, but graduate school is a very special time when those of you who get there, get there, who are interested in it. And you should take your time with it. And being an undergraduate is a special time. You should take your time with that and do all sorts of other things besides the science, because you don't have, I mean, one of the best graduate students that I've ever had in my laboratory was a literature major in, in college. Went to a four-year college, didn't do much research in college, a little bit here and there with some people, but he was a literature major. We talk about, you talked about earlier with, with science, all that, that, that critical thinking is very important. Well, you know, critical thinking, the people who really teach critical thinking the best are the people who work in literature, history, philosophy, that's all they do. They don't do experiments. They have nothing to do but critical thinking. So if you want to learn how to read critically and think critically, I advise taking courses in literature and the humanities in general, because you won't get that in science courses. Critical thinking, oddly enough, is never taught in science courses, it seems to me. They just teach you a lot of facts. They don't really ever ask you to think critically and say, well, you know, why, why do you believe in evolution? Because I told you. Why do you believe in that DNA works this way? Well, because I told you to. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, we used to have something in, in molecular biology. They don't teach it this way so much anymore. But, you know, there was something called the central dogma. You'll still see this in textbooks. The central dogma in molecular biology is DNA to RNA to protein. 
and that was considered the central dogma of, of molecular biology. My first question is, what is science doing with a word like dogma? I mean, that's not right. We don't have dogma in science. We don't have, you know, a law that's inviolate that could never be changed or anything like that. And in point of fact, that central dogma is totally wrong. I mean, we now know that RNA feeds back to DNA, protein feeds back on RNA. Some parts of DNA can be modified epigenetically now by, by even by behavior and feed. There are all sorts of loops and feedback and things like that. So it's not DNA to RNA to protein. That's not the way it works. And so, um, and so, but nobody ever asked you to critically think about that. You know, they just feed you new data. So anyway, that's my idea about critical thinking. Sorry. <laughs> Go no, on. <laughs> we'll never get through this. No worries. Dr. Farsan, I just want to in really quickly because your perspective is really eye-opening to me. Like I come from, actually it's ironic because on Friday, um, I was just in class for biology and my teacher was talking about the central dogma and he was emphasizing that, this is, you know, the central concept in biology, like you must know DNA, RNA, and then protein. So it's really interesting that you get this point. And now that I think about it, um, like humanities plays such a big role in science. If I feel like for someone like you, especially, you have a humanities background, right? And a lot of the other, you know, esteemed science professors, um, people who are top in their fields actually come from a humanities background. So I just wanted to ask you, like, like Scarlett was saying before, um, you said you were in your late 20s and you had your whole career in theater before you started um, pursuing a, um, like a degree in biology, right? So what kind of gave you this motivation or like, more? Well, I would say the courage because you know, like you were saying in society nowadays, everything's like, you have to be on time. You have to rush, rush, rush to get your degree. After your degree, you gotta go to med school, be a doctor and have your whole life set, right? So I just wanted to know like, what made you decide, oh, I'm already established in theater, but I want to pursue this whole new career in biology? Uh, so probably just, a, <laughs> probably just a lack of, of being smart enough to know better in a way. I mean, you know, I, I worked in the theater and I worked my way up through the theater and I thought, well, you could, you know, why couldn't you sort of do that again? I mean, we, we all live longer, twice as long as people used to live on average. So why not do second thing. I, it was just something that was really interesting to me. And I saw, I mean, I have to say, for the most part, I did it in small steps. I took this class, then I took another class, then this great mentor, Hal Marco, was sort of little by little sort of suggested to me, why not take a degree in biology? You're good at this. Take this class, you'll find it interesting. Take that one, you'll find it interesting. So, and at any point, I could have dropped out. I could have just said, okay, I've had enough of this. But I just kind of kept going with it because it continued to be interesting. I didn't really, I have to say, make a decision that required, if you will, some courage that, that really changed everything in my life until I finished the degree in biology and realized that, you know, an undergraduate degree in biology is, I hate to say this to you, worthless <laughs> in, in terms of a career. Well, I mean, in the sense of, you know, what kind of job are you going to get with it? So an undergraduate degree in biology is what lets you go to medical school or graduate school or, or things like that. And so I realized then that was really the only decision point. So I had my undergraduate degree I got when I was about 34 or 35 years old. Now, not a, not a kid, but, you know, and I thought, well, I'm going to apply to graduate schools. And if I get into a graduate school, I'm going to give up the theater and go to graduate school and try for a career in science. If I don't get into graduate school, well, I'll just keep working in the theater with my undergraduate degree in biology. And I haven't lost anything. It's been intellectually very stimulating. So that's what I did. I applied to a bunch of graduate schools. I got turned down by most of them. I mean, especially in those days, 35 was quite old to be starting graduate school. Now we do take older students as a second career thing. It's not as quite as uncommon, but this was in 1983 or something like that. None of you were even born then, I'm guessing. So, um, so it was a little different. It wasn't quite as strict. Uh, it wasn't quite as strict as I find things are today. And, um, and I, you know, I applied to a bunch of places. I got turned down by most places, but Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, took me into their program. I'm fond of saying, I think as the result of a clerical error, somebody made a mistake, they checked the wrong box. It was supposed to be no, and they checked yes instead. But I went, <laughs> I said yes immediately. 
And I gave up the theater and started graduate school. I was very lucky to have another great mentor in graduate school, a fellow named Frank Werblin, who I'm still very close friends with. And that helps a great deal as well. I think you really have to find mentors. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they're out there. There are good ones. They're not so good ones, but there are good ones. And the most important thing you can do, I think, as a student, is to find the right mentor, somebody who's open to the possibility of you doing a variety of things, who, who wants to help focus you, who wants to help move you along, but is also open to you as an individual and your interests, your individual interests, and being a, as, you know, as, as wide a personality as possible, and not just, not just a worker bee scientist, as it were. You know, yeah. now, I mean, there's some people that that's all they want and that's fine too. I don't have a problem with that, but I don't think we should, I don't think that should necessarily be the model. Mm -hmm. So yet, I don't think there's a dogma. I don't think there's a central dogma in molecular biology. And I don't think there's a dogmatic way to have a career in science. I think there are many, many paths. You just have to be ready to explore them and take a gamble on a few of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Somebody, I think it was the, it was the president of, I'm sorry, I want to say just one last thing about this. The president, the former president of Barnard College, which is part of Columbia University, but it's the all women's college part of Columbia, um, was once asked something, she, I forget what the question was, but her an, was her answer to why one should go to college. And she said, well, the reason you really should go to college is that you have to spend your entire life inside your head. And so you should make that an interesting place to be. And I thought that's exactly right. That is exactly the reason. And so the thing to do with your life that way is you want to make sure that the inside of your head is an interesting place to be because you're going to spend your whole life there. All right. I'm sorry. Let's go on. Oh, that's very <laughs> insightful. Thank you so much. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you want to like address this, but is there like a specific experiences, experience uh, so, throughout yeah. your years or career that you think it's really memorable? <sighs> These are always difficult questions, I have to say, because I always, I, I, so you know, I also wrote a book called Failure, because I thought that was the other interesting thing about science is that most of what we do fails, and it's very important that it do so, and learning about failure in science is very important. We'll talk about that maybe in a little more detail in a moment. But, um, but the result is I always get asked the question, so what was your biggest failure? You know, what was your most important failure? Or I often get asked, what do you think your most important discovery was? And I don't, uh, so my first answer to what I think my most important discovery was is the one that I haven't made yet, of course. I mean, that's my hope. The most important discovery is still yet to be made. If I thought I'd already made my most important discovery, why would I be going to work every day? You know, so one always hopes that the most important thing you're going to discover is the one that's coming up. Um, the other thing is that none of them are actually the most of anything. There's not... For me at least, and I think I find this with other scientists talking with them as well, it's, it's always problematic to ask them what their most important this was or their most memorable that, either failure or discovery or moment in science or something like that. I mean, there are memorable moments. I can remember as a graduate student getting the first uh, record. I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me turn that off. Okay. Sorry. Um, getting my first recording. Uh, physiological, electrophysiological recording of the activity of an olfactory neuron, a living olfactory neuron that was in a dish at that point. They come from the nose of a salamander, as it happened. And and I remember that was a that was a I was the, I was at that point the first person to have ever seen these particular currents and voltage changes in uh, in the neuron of a of a of a brain in response to an odor. And it was late at night, it was around nine or 10 o'clock at night in the lab. And I left the lab that night thinking, wow, this is remarkable because I am, I may be the only person on the planet who's ever seen this right now. I mean, tomorrow morning I'll show it to everybody and tell everybody about it. But for this moment, I'm the only person on the whole planet that knows this, you know? That's a sort of a funny feeling, but, but it's not an uncommon one. Many scientists will tell you this, that they make some discovery late at night and suddenly realize, Oh my goodness, nobody else in the whole world knows this particular thing at this particular moment. I mean, they will very shortly, but so, so, but there are lots of those. And I mean, that's what makes a career in science so interesting is you, you bounce around and you never know where the most memorable thing will, will come from or, 
what's most memorable today will be sort of forgotten tomorrow. Science progresses very rapidly. There are, you know, uh, Im really important discoveries, I think, that came out of my laboratory 20 years ago that today seem trivial. They're in a textbook somewhere, but, you know, nobody thinks of them as a great discovery. They just are part of the story. That's true. Thank you so much, though. It is mm -hmm. exciting to know that you're the first one to discover something. Um, yeah. So I'm going to skip a couple questions because okay. I think we're running a little bit short of time. And I do want to address some of the attendee oh questions that we have for later on. So, okay, I'll try to make shorter answers, too. Um, we have, it, as, as here you can see, it, attendees, that we have some information about his books that we will be able to share with you all of you with this uh, Google Slides that you can refer to later or you can um, go uh, look at them yourself on the science um, website. So how about let's move on to some miscellaneous questions mostly consisting of attendee questions. So hmm, what advice uh, attendee asked, what advice do you have for students who are applying for research experiences in laboratories? Um, I, I don't know that I have any exceptional advice to give you that you probably don't already know. Um, the best thing, of course, to do is to, is to you know, do a little bit of reading. I, I mean, you have some idea what you're particularly interested in. Some of you are interested in neuroscience, others are interested in immunology, others might be interested in virology or bacteriology or, or not uh, biology at all. I mean, maybe, I don't know whether you also have people, I assume, who are interested in physics or, um, or chemistry or things like that. So that's the first thing to do is try and circle around, get an idea of what your interests are, and then um, try and give a look through the literature. I mean, fortunately, you all have access to the internet now, which, you know, we didn't have in my day. Back then, you had to go to the library, you know, which was uphill both ways. You had to walk uphill both ways to get to the library. Just joking. Um, so, so you know, make use of it and find out who's doing what research seems to be interesting to you, um, and then read a, as much of their stuff as you can. Read a few papers and then reach out to them with as specific a kind of question as you can. That is, you know, I'm really interested in this part of your research. I read this paper. You don't have to give their whole thing, but I read this particular paper that came out of your lab recently, and I find this very interesting and would, you know, would like to join your, your group in some ways or gain some experience in research. There are, um, at, you guys are mostly sort of high school, early college. So, so there are a few obstacles in some areas now. We used to have, I used to regularly invite uh, high school students into my laboratory. I don't do that as much anymore because there have become these sort of legal and regulatory issues about it. Because we have hazardous chemicals in the lab, we have animals in the lab and all the rest of this sort of stuff. And so it's much more difficult now for me to invite high school students into the lab. I can, if I have the right kind of project where it can be more analytical, where they don't have to handle dangerous chemicals or be around them, then we can do it. But if it's like involves microscopy or something like that, then it's maybe more possible, but it's difficult. And that's difficult in chemistry labs too. It's not impossible, but it is a little bit harder, I would say. I think the most important thing about research experience is, in the end, it doesn't matter what lab you do it in or what kind of research experience you get. Just, you know, the important thing, so for example, when we look at applicants to graduate school, um, or I guess, I don't know what about applicants undergraduate, I don't manage that as, as a faculty member, it's done in our office of undergraduate admissions. They say research is important, research experience is an important thing to have, I guess it is. At the graduate level, we think it is because, if you don't know this already, and many of you may know, a great deal of research is, uh, it, it fails, you know, and, it, and it's, it can be terribly disappointing and things like that. It can be very, very hard. You work many long hours and some things work, some things don't work and so forth if you're really involved in research. And so it's important at the, grad, the graduate level, we like to know you've had that experience because that's what most people drop out of graduate school for that reason. You know, they can't, they feel like, oh, I'm, not getting anything to work. I can't do this. 
when you can do it. You just have to learn that that's part of research. So I would say any research experience is valuable and don't be too picky about it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that's a, I think it's about a similar question. So perhaps we can skip that. Oh, um, so another attendee asked, for high school students that are current, who currently want to be more involved, involved in the STEM field, what are the next steps that need to be taken in order to work in this field professionally in the future? So I'd, I'd like to say that in my opinion, there is no simple recipe for this. It's not as though if you just simply follow this method and follow these rules, you will then become a professional scientist or you'll be able to work professionally in the field. I mean, yes, you know, sure, you should take some science classes or science courses, but really, um, when you get to graduate school, uh, let's say that's the course you wanna do. You wanna be a professional scientist, so you go to graduate school. You will take courses again in graduate school because we all recognize that everybody comes from a varied undergraduate background. They know this, they know that, and we wanna try and teach again sort of principles of a field and, and get you set up to ask questions. And so it almost, as I said earlier, the best graduate student I ever had was a literature major in, in, uh, as an undergraduate. He took a lot of science classes as well, so he knew some science, but he was really um, a literature major, and that was just fine because he was able to read quite well and, and as I say, think very critically. So, so I wouldn't say there's a simple recipe. I mean, I think you want to take some science classes. You want to get some basic science, at least for yourself to know that this is what you really want to do you know, that this is the kind of adventure you want to be involved in. And, and maybe you won't. Maybe after a while you realize that there's something, there are other things that interest you more. Sociology, literature, finance, I don't, whatever it might be. There are a million things to do out there in the world. And if you're interested in science to begin with, you must be a curious person. And that curiosity can go in many, many directions. So I wouldn't try and look for a recipe. I would say do what you find most interesting intellectually to you develop yourself intellectually so that when you go to an interview, you can have an interesting conversation with somebody and they say to themselves, boy, I'd love to have this person in my lab because they're smart, they're thoughtful, and we could have some really interesting conversations. So remember that, one last thing to remember, I know you think that it's very competitive to get into graduate school or medical school, and it is, there's no question about that. But you should also see it from the perspective of the faculty. So we also find that we are competing with every other school for the best students, right? So you think it's all up to us to select, but in point of fact, usually the best students, which I'm guessing are many of you, will get two or three offers. You know, you'll apply to three or four or five or six, 10 graduate schools or medical schools, and, and two or three of them at the very least will say yes. So now we have to, now it's a competition for you, actually. We're always looking for the best possible students. And so it goes back and forth, really. It's not all, oh, am I going to, you know, it's not just you auditioning and hoping for the, for the best or something like that. So I think that's an, that's an important sense of confidence that you should have in yourself. Remember, the whole purpose of graduate school for us, for, for profess the professors, the members of the faculty, my interest in graduate students is I want to train you to be my colleague. That's what you're there for. You're there for five or six years so that at the end of that time, we are colleagues. We are now working together as scientists in a field. And that's what we're trying to do. And so I want somebody who I think when they walk into my office for an interview at the very beginning, I want somebody who I can see that potential in. And that means they should be bright and curious, passionate, and I don't care how much they know they'll learn what they need to know. That's very cool. Um, another attendee asked, said that, I'm very interested in applying to Columbia University. Could you explain the highlights and courses in Columbia's biology department? Uh, um, I, I, I could, I don't think it's very much different than anywhere else. I mean, these things, uh, we're talking about undergraduate at least. Um, I. Columbia is a little bit different. There's one big difference, which is that Columbia University has something called the core curriculum. So we're one of the very few universities that still has a standardized core curriculum. 
in which you take the entire undergraduate class in their first couple of years, take a series of classes that are all the same. They take them in small groups of 15 or 20. So they're small classes, but the entire undergraduate class takes these courses. They're sort of great books courses. There's one called Literature Humanities, another called Contemporary Civilization or something. There's Art Humanities. There's a Frontiers of Science class. And the interesting thing about this is so most of the universities have given up on that and they just require you to fulfill in addition to your major requirements like for science if you're a chemistry major or biology major you have some requirements they also require you to have taken two classes in history and three in literature and one in the arts or something like that but it's a sort of a restaurant menu thing you can pick whichever ones you want you know at columbia everybody takes the same class so everybody's reading the same books and that's, I think, very interesting because there are lots of conversations that go on with the students, no matter whether you're in the same class or not, you get to have these interesting conversations. And everybody has this deep foundation in the humanities and the arts and science before they go on to their major. So I think that's a big difference at Columbia, and I like that. I, I find that's great because, once again, the students who come into my neuroscience class in their junior or senior year, their third or fourth year, I know they've had two years of what I would call training in critical thinking and reading and writing. And so I don't have to worry about that. Writing, by the way, I can't stress enough. It's an extremely important thing to learn because as a scientist, you will spend a vast amount of your time writing. You don't think so. You know, you think, oh, I'm just going to be pouring things from test tube into test tube or pipetting or this or that. But actually, Aside from professional writers and journalists, scientists probably spend more of their time writing than almost any other profession. We write papers, we write grants, we write reviews, we write letters, we write all sorts of things. Um, and the better you are at writing, the more efficient you'll be and the better your time will be spent. So, so I think Columbia is very good for that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I like Columbia, that's why I'm there. <laughs> I'm actually like, doing research on Columbia University right now because I'm applying there, probably early decision. And then ah, I, right. uh, for the core curriculum, like the major thing that stuck out to me was that no matter what major or background these students are coming from, if you go, like if you sit together and you're trying to, you know, get to know each other in the beginning, you're automatically going to talk about the same things. At least there's a common like area where you can discuss. For example, like if you're taking um, a literature, like the com Co contemporary civilization you can talk about the odyssey or if you're taking frontiers of science together there's just always something in common that you guys yes. have which in other schools um like let's say you know other top colleges where you have quote unquote the freedom to choose whatever you want to take it actually poses a disadvantage because you don't know like what everyone else is taking so that's that's absolutely my daughter was an undergraduate at columbia as it turns out I never expected that would happen, but she was. And that's exactly her experience. She says that's exactly the case. And I hear that all the time from the undergraduates. So I think it's a brilliant way to do it, yes. But I think Columbia and the University of Chicago are the only two places, the only two universities that still do this core curriculum idea. I think the core gets a bad rep, but I actually like it a lot. Yes, yes. Well, good, you're the right, I mean, it's a self-selecting thing to some extent. There are students who won't come to Columbia because of the core, and there are people who will come to Columbia because of the core, and that's perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, does it, I, let's see in that we still have a little bit of time before yeah. it ends. Uh, how, I think there's one question that I think uh, is rather like, it's really important that I think we should address. So, um, which is this one, Look, what do you think is the most important factor, be it experience, event, characteristic, etc., in your student years that led you to where you are today? What is the most important? Right. So, well, so again, I'm going to say, you know, I, to single one out is probably unrealistic and I would be lying to you in some way or another. So I don't think there's one most important thing. There's a, an accumulation of events that sometimes you don't even realize that this is where it was leading. In fact, you know, things often look like the great story in retrospect because, oh, well, I'm here where I am now, and now I can see, here's the way I got here. Here are the critical things that got me here. But I wasn't thinking that on the way to getting here, you know. Um, I mean, this is, 
this is why evolution looks like design. This is why the world looks designed because we look at what it is and we go, well, the only way you could have done that was by a set of thoughtful, intelligently designed steps. But that's not the case, of course. Evolution is the biggest accident in the world or a compilation of huge accidents, right? So what's the most important thing that made it possible for human beings to exist on the planet Earth? Well, it turns out probably it was an asteroid hitting the planet, but you know, who could have seen that, right? Who would have said, oh, well, the most important thing would be if we could just have an asteroid hit the planet and wipe out the dinosaurs, the mammals will take over and eventually you'll get to human beings. Yeah, okay, but that's, you know, nobody can engineer that. So in retrospect, that might have been the most important, but it wasn't at a time. And, and even after the asteroid hit, there's an accumulation of events that lead to, let's say, human beings, assuming you think, you know, we're, we're an important idea here on the planet, which remains to be seen. So for me, what, what would I say is the most important experience? Um, I'm sure as soon as this is over and I go have another cup of coffee, the answer will pop into my head but it will be too late then. Um, so so I, I, I don't really know. I think, uh, let's go to high school because it's the most distant from what I think, you know, it's the most distant from how I could have predicted where I am today. In high school, I was, I was interested in science, but I wasn't really planning a career in science. I was in the theater club in high school and there was a wonderful sponsor of the theater club there a, uh, an English teacher whose name was David Rosenberg, long, long ago gone, I'm sure. And he had a, he was a, a wonderful amateur magician. He believed, he had this whole idea about magic and why magic was at the basis of the theater, the, the illusion and illusion, but not, how can I put it? Magic is quite an interesting thing in, in, in science, I think. I mean, why is it that we're fooled by very simple illusions? Richard Feynman, famous physicist once said, the whole purpose of science is to not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. And that's true, right? We know, I mean, one of the things that intrigues us about magic is somebody does a, a magic trick. I have many friends who are magicians and they do a magic trick and you go, how did, how did, it? the first thing you want to do is a scientist, how do they do that? How did that happen? You know? And, um, and the, and the most disturbing thing is to learn how a magic trick is done and to go, Really? There's no way it could be that simple and stupid. Really? That's all you did? You just conned me that easily? I'm that stupid about this, you know? Because we, you know, magicians know what we're looking for and they do something a little different and we keep looking for that thing. And, and so I think it's a great, um, it's a great lesson. And, and he was, uh, again, I go back to the idea that the most important thing in your lives is, are good mentors. And if you come up, if you attach yourself to, if you find somebody you think is going to be a good mentor, attach yourself to them. Just, you know, no matter what they, no matter how they may try and shoo you away, you just stick with them. That's okay. And um, because that, that's the most important thing you can find really is somebody who, you know, challenges you intellectually, but also has your best interest at heart in some ways and doesn't just have a formula for you. So to me, that was a very important experience in high school was running across this, um, this fellow who's a magician. I don't know, do you guys know the magic act Penn and Teller? Are they sort of world famous or world famous enough? Penn is the one, Teller is the one who's always quiet. He's sort of mute. And Penn is this big guy. Anyway, they run this magic show. They're on television all the time, and at least in America. And I thought they were sort of well known internationally. I went to school with them and at high school with them. And they were in this drama club and went on to become very well known professional magicians who retain, they may be the most interested people in science I know, a couple of magicians know, uh, who are, who I know who, they always find science to be extremely interesting. This is a little bit off the track, so I'm not suggesting you all go to magic school because you want to become scientists. I'm really suggesting that it turn out to be an important, you know, sort of thing for me. But I can't really tell you one moment that I, you know, the veil was lifted and I went, aha, this will be my life. I don't know, it's a series of fortunate accidents. So the important thing is not having a direction you're going to go into me, but when something good happens, recognizing that something good happened and take advantage of it. That I see all the time. Things, people get an opportunity and fail to recognize they have this opportunity and make something of it. 
So that's really more important is opportunities will come along all the time. You have to be smart enough to, what is it that Louis Pasteur said about chance and uh, chance favors the prepared mind. It's a very famous uh, quote that, you know, we all think that a lot of science happens by what's called serendipity, you know, by a fortunate accident. You were doing this experiment, but this thing showed up, you know, penicillin was discovered by accident because somebody left the, left the culture dish on the windowsill and, you know, instead of in the hood and penicillin grew on it. And so, you know, this was an accident, but it, but, but the fact is accidents, discoveries don't get made by accident. Accidental scientific discoveries don't get made by lawyers. They get made by, by scientists. They get made by people who are working on something very hard. Now, it may be that they find something they weren't looking for, but if they weren't working hard on it and they didn't recognize, you know, could have penicillin is a good example. It was a, you know, a culture dish that had been left out on the windowsill and penicillin grew in it. Somebody could easily have come along, looked at that culture dish and gone, ugh, what's this? And thrown it in the trash can, right? And it would have been another 10 years before we had penicillin or the idea of antibiotics. But somebody instead went, oh boy, that's interesting. What could that possibly be? Put it under the microscope and looked and discovered penicillin, you know? There's a, there's a quote by Isaac Asimov, the science writer, who said, um, what every scientist really wants to hear when they look at data is not Eureka, wow, it's, oh, that's weird. And that really is what you wanna see when you look at data, something that's strange, something that you didn't expect. So to sort of answer this question, I hope, is I don't know what the most important thing was or what the most important thing you could do is, but I do know that chance favors the prepared mind and therefore you should be, you, you should be cognizant of the possibilities when they come along and take advantage of them when they're there. And that's what's, smart to do. That's very true. I never really thought of that. But um, since we're a little bit short of time, I, I want to bring the conversation back to the books you've written. So okay. the, uh, let me skip to it. So you had a book called Ignorance, yep. uh, How to Drive Science that you talk, talked about in your courses and all that. So what are some obstacles that came to writing this book? How was it like transitioning from write a six year long, like six, like six years worth of coursework and turn it into one book? Um, I wish I could tell you it was a terrible, terrible struggle, but it wasn't actually. I didn't have any idea about writing a book. So I just sort of sat down and tried to do it. <clears throat> I found that writing a book was a really, for me, was a very pleasurable discipline. I, I, I had this discipline and I followed with it. I mean, you know, I have a busy schedule. I have a lab full of people. I had a, a daughter, not young, but a teenage daughter at the time. So, you know, family and, um, and I was teaching. So I had a lot of things going on. Where was I gonna write this book? And I just decided the only way to do this, I'm not really a morning person. I prefer the night, but by the time nighttime ar arrived, it was too late to try and start on something like a book. So I started this discipline of waking up every morning at 6 a.m. And, and saying from 6 to 7.30, I will write this book. I will work on nothing but the book. No email, that's the killer. Don't open your email. No, no on the internet unless it's for research purposes. And I will either write or rewrite, which is you know part of what you have to do, edit, rewrite, or I'll read some material that needs to be read for the book, or I'll go over things like that. And I will work for an hour and a half. And at 7.30, I will stop. Because from 6 to 7.30, nobody even thought I was awake because everybody know I'm sort of a night owl. So nobody even thought I was awake. So they wouldn't even call me or anything. So I had this time to myself. Nobody wanted me for anything else. And I learned that if you just sit down and you really take that hour, hour and a half, you can write pretty easily 1,000 or 1,500 words. They might not be the best 1,500 words, so you go back and edit them. I like to edit. I actually like to revise and edit. I like to just write as whatever I want to write, and then I enjoy the revision and editing process. Some people don't like it, but I like to go back over it sentence by sentence and say, now, is that what I really think I mean here? Is that what I want somebody to take away from this? But I found that you know if I did that, then pretty quickly I had about a 30 or 40,000 word book and I wanted it to be a short book as it is because people always ask you when you write a book, who do you think your audience is? Who are you writing for? And I like to say, well, I, I like to think that the, my audience are busy people. 
people who are very busy are the people I'd like to read my book because busy people are the ones who get things done, right? And so, but if you're writing a book for busy people, you have to be very respectful of their time. You can't expect them to read four or 500 pages of your, you know, bull, <laughs> shall we say. So I tried to keep it very succinct and that was, that was maybe the most difficult thing was to keep it, and you know, you can read this book really in, in a few hours, in a couple of sittings at the most. Um, and I wanted it to be that way. I wanted it to be a set of ideas that would, that would create ideas in other people. I didn't want it to be a finished product in an odd way. I wanted it to be hanging there. Um, that's the way I always thought about the theater. I think my theater background has something to do with that. I wanted it to be something that, it, that engaged you and made you think, you know, but didn't just fill you up with my ideas. There's another quote, I'm sorry to use all these quotes, by the poet William uh, Butler Yeats who talks about education. And he said that education is not the filling of buckets, it's lighting fires. And I, I agree. I mean, that's what we should be doing with education. That's what I wanted the book to do, was not to fill you up with a bunch of ideas that were mine, but to light some ideas in the reader. So that was the, the idea of writing the book. And it worked somehow or another. And I enjoyed it, I must say, immensely. I didn't think I would, but I did. I think enjoying writing what you produce is really important to feel proud and feel, and like, to feel happy while doing what you love. So, um, is yeah, you discover a lot when oh, you yeah. write. You know, somebody once said, and I think it's true, how do I know what I think until I've written it down? And it's true. I mean, the many things that I wound up writing in that book that I thought, I didn't really even know I thought that exactly that way. But once you actually start to write it down, you go, oh, that's, that's turned out to be more interesting than I expected it to be, you know? So writing is actually an act of discovery. It's not just emptying something out that you already have in you. It is to some extent a way of discovery. I'm sorry, go on. No, it's all right. Um, so Molly, our co-founder, co she just asked in the chat, um, does anyone have any questions for the first time before we close out? Um, so do, do you mind waiting for a little bit to see if- No, no, not at all. Oh, okay, that's No, so, of course. Let me tell you quickly about failure. You want to hear really quickly about failure, which I think is actually the more important of the two books, although ignorance has been the more popular of the two. But I think oh. failure is very important because there's a lot of talk about failure these days and the idea of, you know, failure is sort of, should be seen sometimes as a positive thing. It's a way to build perseverance. You have to learn how to fail. You have to learn how to manage failure, and et cetera, et cetera. All these sort of self-help things. And I think all of that's true to some extent, but it's not the kind of failure that this book talks about. I think there's a notion of failure specific in many ways to science that's very important. That failure in science is a crucial part of the process, that you must fail, and you must fail a lot, actually. Fallibility is what gives science its credentials, if you will. If everything we ever did with science, if it always worked, you wouldn't believe it, right? I mean, you think this has to be a con job or it's not interesting because we already knew that's what it was gonna be. So it's really important that you keep up a fairly high rate of failure in science because that gives, you, that gives it a certain integrity. That's one thing. The other really important thing is, is that if you do agree with me that ignorance is what science is about, that is that the unknown is what we're interested in in science, then the very, very deepest kind of unknown, the really deep ignorance is the, what we call the unknown unknown, the stuff you don't even know you don't know, right? I mean, yeah, I don't know this, but there are probably things I don't even know I don't know because I haven't been able to think of that, right? How would you think of that? And so how do you get to this deep, this really deep ignorance of the unknown unknown, if you will? And I think the way you do that, or the best way to do that is through failure. You do an experiment because you don't know something and you think the experiment will help you to know it. So you do the experiment and then you get a result that's not the result you expected, nor is it a result that you even understand. You say, well, that experiment failed. Well, why did it fail? It failed because there was something I didn't even know that I didn't know about this process. Now I have to go back and think about what that might be and do a whole set of experiments about that. And so that's the way into this really deep ignorance is by failing essentially. And as I said before, this Isaac Asimov thing is you don't want to say, when you see data, you don't want to say, yes, Eureka, the work, that's nice now and again. But what you really want to say is, wow, that's weird. How come that happened? 
So that's about failure. All right, maybe there's a maybe there's a question, or maybe I've scared everybody off. Um, I don't think there's a question in the chat, and de no, you ha definitely haven't okay. scared anyone off. It's really interesting to hear <laughs> really your intakes about all the scientific concepts and all that. So, um, seeing that we have a little little bit, that I guess, um, I'm sorry for like the messiness of this. Um, Not at all. This, this is this is, science is messy. <laughs> messy is good. That's how that we've embodied the concept of science pretty yes, well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes, um, that, well, that's great. I'm all for messy. Messy is where good things happen. All right. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and doing this webinar for, for us. It's been so insightful to hear what you think about you and your path throughout your years, science or not. And thank you to the attendees for attending this webinar. Feel free to check out our website at www.scienceholic.org for any of our social media accounts for regular updates about scientific concepts. And also, um, shortly, we would send you a follow-up survey about your experience in this webinar. So if you would please kindly um, fill, that, fill that out, it will really help us um, create better content for you all next time. If you're still interested in attending or um, just visiting with some of our content. So once again, thank you, Dr. Feinstein, for coming and joining us today. And thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a joy to talk with you. I think the questions were marvelous. I always judge a talk based on the questions that I get. And these questions were exceptional. And thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity to talk with you guys. Please, uh, you know, email me now and again. I'm not great at answering emails. Sometimes you have to send it two or three times. But email me if, you know, if questions come up. Please, I'm, you know, I'm happy to Obviously, I'm happy to talk. So, <laughs> so um, any 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 time at all. I think you're. It's great that you have this organization. Thank you. Um, to the attendees, if you're interested in emailing um Dr. Ba, Dr. Bastan directly about your questions, seeing that someone has asked that in the chat, you can find so on Columbia's faculty member page because currently, I I don't have it at hand right now. I'm very sorry about that. But you can do find it on this. One second. It's, Okay, thank you, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm really easy to find on the web, unfortunately. There's no, I have no, no place I'm... to hide. So if you put my name in, especially if you, put, unfortunately, if you put my name in and the word ignorance, a lot of stuff pops up. So that's a <laughs> sign of the so I've gotten to be known for ignorance and failure very well, you know. So it's pretty, yes, that's it, SJF24. So, that's, so please email me, that's fine. And if any of you do wind up at Columbia, make sure you email me and come see me, all right? All right, thank you so much for everyone well, for joining. Only... <laughs> all right, thank you so much okay. everyone for joining. Thank you, Dr. Feinstein, and hopefully we'll see you all very again very soon.